Hey, quick question. Anybody got a Apple dongled for VGA? Anybody? Share an Apple VGA dongle. We promise you'll get it back. You get a hold of one? Yes, for MacBook. Final? 
Not a ton. I'm, I'm pretty much going to stay right I love it. All right, I'm going to check this. Well, technically, we still have five minutes, right? Okay.
Let's see how this goes. I had this great idea. I said, buy all this camera equipment and we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll try to capture some of our presentations at conferences. And then they did. And so now I have to deal with this. I had to fix my own spelling mistake there. I did a little too much rethinking. Of maybe I'll do a different tagline and yeah. Ha! Ah, hi everybody. Uh, so it's the end of the day, and I know you're like super excited to get out of here. So I will do my best to both be informative, entertaining, and short. Um, if we can do all those things, then, then we win. Uh, I'm really excited to present to you both the, the concepts that we have been uh, testing and uh, the tools that we have been using to test these ideas and hopefully put uh, behind the concept uh, two years of research that we've been doing toward uh, the approach. And I'm not trying to be cryptic here. But we're talking about game-based education. We're talking about it in, in a couple of different ways. And it's a very popular topic right now, gamification. Um, the problem is we've had lots of other popular you know, topics over the years, not the least of which being corporal punishment and you know, some of those things that did not last, um, that seemed like a good idea. Uh, but didn't have the uh, maybe the, the support. And I, I hope that I'm going to slant that into the, well, I guess those who are using games or game-based approaches, there's some validity behind that, and, and we, can, we can demonstrate it. Um, before um, I, I, I teach at the university, and before I got out of education, I was a high school teacher. I taught band, um, right? actually two consecutive life terms as a band director. It was almost 10 years. And, which was wonderful. I love it. Um, I miss a lot of my students. Um, I do not miss four-hour bus rides on a co-ed bus um, with a flashlight saying, now, which, which one is your leg? 
So those of you who have done, done those trips know exactly what I'm talking about. It, it's, it's a rough deal. I, I did win the, uh, the Nobel Prize for band directing. Um, it's quantified when you, when you take more than 100 trips with students and you don't end up with a band trip baby. So thank you. Um, the secret behind that is girls bus and boys bus. So even though they tried to, tried to uh, you know, smuggle boys aboard, um, we, we, never, we never got through that. So, so I, come from a, I come from a position of, hey, I was almost a real teacher because I taught band. Um, but I do. I teach, I teach future teachers at Boise State University. I teach both uh, in our undergrad program. Those are the folks uh, about to become teachers. And I teach in our master's program who are really ready to be done with teaching. So you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, before we begin, if, if you want to if you want to kind of chat about this, if you want to like start a discussion that we, the collective we, can continue after this, then I would encourage you to make connections through Twitter. I realize it's kind of small. I apologize. It's understated. Uh, but go ahead and, and, and if, if I say something you know, that you like, tw tweet about it. And we'll, we'll continue the conversation. I don't think we're going to have this problem. Uh, I, I did a... Uh, I did a conference recently in Canada where I, I presented to a group of computer educators. And, uh, and quite a few of them did not know what tweeting was. I don't know if it was a, can a Canada thing or a language difference, even though they speak English as well. But a couple of them thought tweeting was when you peed in your pants a little. Evidently, that's a thing. So if you think that's what tweeting is, please don't tweet. Don't retweet. Don't tweet your neighbors. Okay, so we'll get, we'll get started uh, here, assuming, there we go. Um, so the students we teach, really the landscape of education and the role of teachers is about to change. In fact, it's going to change more in the next 10 years than it probably has in the last 100. Uh, a shift in the educational paradigm is already taking place. You know that because you're here, you see it, uh, both I think from 10,000 feet and from the ground. So the internet, mobile devices, uh, social networks, and even video games will play as much of a role in the next century as textbooks and blackboards and chalk uh, have played in the last. And the, the bad news, though, is we're going to get paid about the same in the next hundred years. So um, just one little uh, idea that I, I want to throw out here. First of all, these are some of the things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the game. And, and I, I will offer in a moment that I think a game already exists, and so we gamify our classroom, but maybe by rules that we don't like. More, more monopoly rules uh, than, uh, than other, other games. So we're going to talk about those things. But I think it's uh, important before we, we kind of dive into this, because the hardest thing for, for folks sometimes, and I don't think that'll be the case with this group, to wrap their mind around is that school is always changing, and it has always changed as a reflection of society. And in a brief and fairly nondescript history lesson, we can go back to the origins of American school. It always reflect the societies that they serve. At the, at the dawn of, of the American continent, uh, the, uh, our forefathers moving here, school existed. It, it existed for a relative few, for the landowners, for those who would be in power, uh, for those who would lead. Those were the people who needed it. School wasn't available for others. Um, as society began to expand, the Western expansion, um, we, in fact, we were just talking, where'd she go, about Mankato, right? We think of Little House on the Prairie, I sure do, I still, I mean, she's older now, but I had a crush on Nellie Olson. I, inside, I think she had a heart of gold. When we talk about Little House on the Prairie, I just ringlets, seriously, the ringlets were fabulous. But small communities needed schools. Schools began to develop as part of our expansionist culture. And, and became these schools that served their local communities. Schools from state to state didn't match curriculum. In fact, it was 25 years after these uh, schools started to dot uh, the plains and the west that there were actually primers created for them. Until then, it was the Bible and whatever the community wanted taught there. We know that the industrial paradigm it ha and, and revolution, it, it tends to really mark the way our schools look now with factory rows and ringing bells. Uh, buildings set aside to produce one type of knowledge. Uh, even the agrarian calendar built on these industrial principles of how schools should be offered. 
Horace Mann, who was an incredibly thoughtful person at the time, not an educator, came out with this wonderful idea. It didn't matter where you were born or what you were born into, that everyone deserved the opportunity to climb out. I mean, he was famous for saying, uh, you know, we, school is to rake a few diamonds from the dirt. Great if you're a diamond, pretty crappy if you're the dirt. Right? School, even in its origins, is based on this production line model where we're trying to find the best and the brightest so we can set those aside for a different purpose. That's our methodology. Still to this day, our ideology is a little bit different, thank goodness, um, but we still have schools built largely on this model. Again, brought to us by, uh, by what the needs of society help, the social changes in our schools. Um, some in this room may remember uh, when schools, maybe not formally, but practically and socially, were still segregated um, by economic uh, status, and in some places it still is, by, by race, uh, by religious status. But we have adopted what, the, what society believes into models that are, are appropriate for school. Um, it didn't used to be that large institutions would educate boys and girls together. My mother went to an all-girls school. And, uh, and that doesn't exist anymore. Society's um, tools, society's approaches have always changed the way school looks. So I offer you this because this change is continuing, and it always will. By the way, it, it takes about 30 years from the time that society decides to make the change to when school is actually adopted. It tends to be generational, uh, the research shows. As, as older teachers move out with their ideas into retirement and golf and and uh, Arizona, um, we find that, uh, that new ideas of younger teachers tend to mold and shape that. Um, just a, a quick thought, we're moving toward this idea of information age schools. Uh, when you're, as, you, as you're here and kind of recognizing the tools that we're talking about, the approaches we're offering, we see that. We see that our societal tools are starting to influence the way we're doing things in school. Um, but these two schools look very different. Um, the schools of the 19th and 20th century, by the way, we're all 20th century students, um, trying to become 21st century students, there were some very different expectations of what school would do and what students would be expected to do. But in the information age, right, our 21st century school, um, we, we have different requirements of our students. Now, that, that doesn't mean that we no longer expect them to respect authority or, or be on time, but we're, whole, we're, we're looking for different standards. Um, and, uh, and th that's an interesting argument to have. So I, I offer this, that we should probably just face the facts that all classes are a game. And we try to figure out what it takes to win from the moment we walk in, the way we prepare, interact, the way we study for our class. Even the way we talk to the teacher is predicated on this assumption that we have about the winning condition. Your winning condition may be different than my winning condition. Now, smart, and savvy teachers know this about the game and they try to slant it in favor of learning, right? And I would, I would guess that, th that this group here is of that variety. We know the way the game is, but we're going to try to even game the system a little bit so we can get our students excited and engaged and, and moved on. You know, all students ask that natural question. What do I need to do to get the grade that I want? Unfortunately, rather than what's worth knowing or how does this fit into, into the life I want to live, how does this make me better, um, school, often keep students guessing. We do this. We coerce them with tests and, and take-home papers. And we surprise them. We try to really force them to interact with the curriculum and, uh, and hold uh, things against them if, if they fail to do this naturally. And we punish them, typically, when they don't do the things that we ask, whether or not they're capable. Now, we gradually chip away at their success with Bs, Cs, and Ds until it's mathematically impossible for them to be successful. And we do this to teach them responsibility, right? The hidden curriculum. Um, but I think it's the stupidest game uh, that we could possibly play, and, and the students hate to play it. So the good news is that we can change the game, and, and here's how. Uh, I offer that we should eliminate homework, that we should get rid of due dates, that we should give our students choice, and we should let them play. And then on the back end, we as teachers and as educational institutions should do a much better job of tracking the learning that's going on and recognizing it in all of its context, not just 1 through 49 odd. So 
Um, this means we must, as teachers, move from, I guess, dictators of, of learning to observers and promoters of it. And I'll get into more of the details because this is, I mean, this is intentionally provocative, of course. Um, but, uh, but we'll get into the details of, of what we're talking about and how this works. Because on the surface, conventional wisdom says if you eliminate homework, if you eliminate due dates, learning won't happen, students won't progress, and those types of things. And the data I have to share with you it shows the opposite of that. And that's pretty exciting stuff. So if we strongly consider it holding uh, all students to the same path uh, and same measurements, same expectations, is actually not fair. When we talk about fairness, well, all students have to do the same thing because that's fair. Um, it's not. Uh, every student, as we know, is completely unique. Yet the traditional approach to schooling is to expect every student, regardless of their background, to perform under the same identical conditions. I mean, that's industrialism at its best. Regardless of what your native language is, this is the expectation. Regardless of your home support system, this is the expectation. And some students sort well. They sort into that A pile. They're the diamonds. And quite a few sort into the others. So let's talk about a couple of systems, and I just mentioned them, that are fundamentally unfair. Now, uh, the first of these is, is homework, right? Homework uh, doesn't mean that uh, students will fail to think, to create, to act outside the classroom. Um, to the contrary, it means that we won't try to regulate where interaction necessarily occurs. We'll give lots of opportunities for it. We'll make it open and available. But we won't say, here, this has to go with you to your, you know, wherever you go. And it has to come back completely done. And for the most part, homework does a better job, uh, and the students actually like this freedom, does a better job of telling us um, which families are better at regulating the students' homework and homework time um, than those that don't. Uh, of course, we need to, we know that. That going into, that the more time we spend authentically working on, uh, on subjects outside of the classroom, uh, the more uh, interaction we have with it. But some students' lifestyle does not support that well. And uh, that then becomes kind of problematic. So we as teachers need to have the sensitivity and the savvy and the skills to know what will work best for each student, not uh, necessarily just the best prepared ones. I mean, our students split time in ways that other generations never had to. I mean, with the litany of jobs and clubs and church activities and sports, and not just one, the travel teams and the uh, driver's ed, doctors, ortho orthodontist visits, uh, family duties like watching siblings, making dinner, chores, and the like. I mean, you know, the list goes on forever. And when faced with the overwhelming volume of to-dos, it's no wonder that some of our students uh, give up. Now, that's not to say that the travel soccer team is more important than, uh, than civics or math. But in that family, it gets the preferential treatment. So homework that doesn't get done, unfortunately, is punishment. I mean, let's, let's call it what it is. And if we punish them enough, especially those uh, students who are not, it's not fully under their control, um, they'll believe that they can't do it. And uh, high standards, of course, are good. Um, punishment is bad. So often, Homework, especially that that's assigned to go to a specific location to be done, uh, tends to create that problem. And we can have this, we can continue this dialogue later. Let me mention another one, due dates. Due dates assume that the assigned space and time are exactly right for a completed activity. But if I give you an assignment on Monday, and I ask you to do it by next Monday, uh, when are you going to do it? Thank you. Now, this is not to call you lazy, because you're not. Um, in fact, it's the exact opposite. We as people do an amazing job of triage. Food comes before homework, because we have to eat. We know, we know these things, right? Um, we decide what's most important, and we tend to it first. And uh, the, think of all the things that rank higher than this assignment. Work, exercise, right? Food, sleep. Nearly everything is more important until it's due. And then uh, we do it. So does it really take seven days? It doesn't. So if by deciding ahead of time, the frame of time before it becomes important, we effectively delay the start of that. And, uh, and there's a lot of research that points to when homework actually gets done based on when it's assigned. So and often, and I, I think this is funny, um, we also determine by due dates the condition in which these uh, are often attempted under late night, short time frame, et cetera. Right? 
organizational structure of due dates ultimately is not for the students, it's for the curriculum and often for the teachers. So we have this massive laundry list of to-dos. So I have one other question for you. So we, I just talked, just talking about those points and then, and then we'll, we'll get into how these concepts were, were woven into a totally different way to deliver a curriculum in, in the game-based approach as I, was, as I was talking. But the final piece is, um, is this idea of, of choice. So I'm going to give you two choices and we'll see hands on this. But you can either jump off a 10 meter diving platform into the pool. There's no fires, no funky, like hidden thing. Oh, it's into a cup of water. You lose. No, that's the other game. That's not this game. Or swim 100 meters in the pool. Who is going to jump off the diving platform? Okay, hands up. Look around. See, see all the other daredevils. All the other cool people. Why? Quicker. Okay. So we all agree that it's quicker. Was that why you raised your hand? It's just quicker? How come? <laughs> you didn't say easy, but I think you meant easy, right? Less immediate effort, less exertion, less chance of injury by diving? Or <laughs> right. You just you just have to activate gravity. Right? <laughs> Yeah, gravity likes me. <laughs> gravity never lets me, always lets me down. Never, okay, that, we won't. We'll do. Any, anybody else? Why? It's exciting. Okay, those who are going to swim, raise your hand. Do you agree that it's exciting? Yeah. The, the, the jump. We don't. Why would you, why would you swim? More benefit from the hard work. What's interesting is that I, it's just two simple choices here. Uh, by the way, who's like, I'm not, why are you making me get wet? Anybody? Yeah, a couple people. Yeah, so what we find when we really drill down to, to the, the schema, and that's the important key word here, the schema behind these decisions, is that we find that your network of experience, the thing that allows you to say it's, it's less work than swimming, um, you know, or, or for you to say, you know, you enjoy the work more, right? It's more beneficial. Yeah, exactly. The, that the background that you bring to that decision is unique to you. And you are in a better place when making a simple choice to activate a piece of the curriculum. Oh, by the way, this is Aquatics 101. And this is a first day activity in my Aquatics 101 class. It's, water, it's a water acclimation assessment. I'm going to talk teachery for a second. And the water acclimation assessment really is, can you enter the water? Can you change directions? Can you find safety on the side? Do I need to put the water wings on you? Test, right? But I've allowed you to choose that which is the most uh, accessible to you. Now, both of these activities assess the same thing. But they are met with different levels of interest. Now. Say, for example, you don't like either one of these, right? Why don't we create a third example? Okay, here's what we need. We need, to, can you get in? Can you change direction? Can you find the side? You know, can you rescue yourself? How would you like to do that? <laughs> There's a hot tub over here. Okay, there we go. And you don't have to be careful. Right? We, we, we made accommodations so that we can assess what we want to do. And I mentioned a little bit ago that maybe teachers can do um, a, a more, not that it's not being done, but a more thoughtful and thorough job of providing multiple ways that we can assess. That one activity, jumping off the high dive, is not the only way to assess what we're doing. In fact, by giving the choice. The problem with a grade book is that we only have one column. So what are you going to put in there? Right? What do you, which one are you going to do? And do you allow people to do both? And, you know, how does it all work? The, the problem with the gradebook approach is that it, it, uh, it locks in individuals to the same pathway. And largely, it locks them into the same time frame to do these things. And that's, that's where we tend to, uh, to lose a lot of our students. This is where we get at. Each of us has a unique schema that allows us to attend to things differently. Um, car people, anybody fix cars in here? Excellent. You and I do not share the, the same schema. Uh, my wife won't let me put oil in the car because one time I put it in the radiator cap. 
They're right next to each other. They're not clearly marked. So I don't have the same schema maybe that you do. That doesn't mean necessarily that I'm dumb, but I lack the experience that allows me to attend to that activity. Um, this is actually the schema of the artist who, who drew these images, and I, I joke all the time because um, I, I said, hey, David, these look like all of your stuff. And he said, yeah, except for the one, the, the mechanic one. He's, he's like I am. He, he just does not have a lot of experience in there. Um, but typically, that experience comes from necessity or family or friends. You just get interested in those things. You work together on those things. You develop that knowledge and understanding. Each of our students comes into our classes with different knowledge and understanding. And often, we'll apply a curricular approach that fails to tap this schema, fails for them to use the intelligence that they come in with. I would argue that we don't have any, any dumb students. They just may not have the same schema and web of understanding that, that we do, uh, or that uh, our curriculum is built on. So choice becomes essential. This is hard 50 years ago. Um, we didn't have post-its. I think you could do it with post-its now, give students uh, quite a bit of choice. But the idea that, that students can take a different pathway through a curriculum and still end up in the same place, the same uh, level of uh, knowledge and understanding, the same uh, meeting of the competencies and the standards, but take a different pathway through that that serves them better. Not just serves them from, from what they already know, but serves them for where they want to go, especially those students who have, a, uh, have interests and sense. So when we look around for tools in our society that support these, we found games. We first looked at social networks. We were looking at, at design, redesigning um, a learning management system to allow for choice, to uh, eliminate some of the things that were causing blockages in student progress and success. And we found that games did a really good job of that. Obviously, they allow us choice. They offer multiple pathways. Um, they, they credit all successes. They, they credit failure in some cases. And as you know, failure can be a wonderful learning tool. So they scaffold the difficulty. They do all of these things. And most of the time, they're fun. Um, games are wildly popular. And they do not require anyone to play them. We play them based on choice. And they reward us in a lot of different ways. So we decided that we'd come up with a system that allowed us to play class. Experience points, um, allowing for failure. In, in fact, if you fail on an activity, if, it's, if it doesn't meet the, the expectations uh, or the competencies, um, they get another uh, attempt at it without penalty, without getting a B minus. Um, we continue to push until they, they demonstrate everything that's necessary. And if that activity doesn't work, we look for another one that does the same thing, but in a different way multiple pathways and the defined winning condition, okay? Which leads to this concept, which you may have heard before, this, this idea, it's, it's said a number of different ways, but this is the way I like to say it, that moving forward, our, honestly, our students do not need us to learn something. There are other places. There didn't used to be, right? But there are other places. They simply need us to get credit. That's not entirely true, but we can, I mean, if you want to learn how to fix, um, you know, a, a computer, uh, you can look online today and you can find some of their resources. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll have the wisdom to vet whether they're accurate, whether they're going to damage. It that doesn't mean you have the wisdom, but you can find the knowledge and, uh, and use that. But I, I really believe that our job is, is not to, uh, I really is to loosen the restrictions on how they learn, right? Often we build a class on the how. Here's how. We're going to address all these subjects and help to apply the context to what they learn. And I'll, I'll share that with you in just a little bit. But I want to, I want to get you into, um, into the system. We know a few things about our students. They're different than we were because they have different tools to interact with. They learn both formally and informally uh, in, in ways that, that uh, our generations often did not. And they do a really good job learning from failure when given the opportunity. Their tools show us that. So, I think there are two ways to think about educational games and playing games at school. One is to bring in a game. Let's just assume it's Super Mario Brothers. Anybody ever learn the shell trick on like warp level seven where you could get infinite lives? And, right, that's a schema. Actually, I mean really, that's a schema. You learn that either by accident or from somebody else. Um, 
That's one way to play to bring games in the classroom. The other is to is to flip it and turn game into excuse me class into a game, and that's what we're talking about right here. Um, there are two ways. There we go, of comparing the two. Um, the approach that we've designed we describe as quest based learning, um, and compare it to a grade book. You see the difference. Uh, a grade book approach is a fixed path. There are metered stops along the way, and everybody takes that same one. They occur in the same order. It's relatively fixed. It's activity driven. Um, grading is typically reductive. You know, you get 85% on this or that. Often it's punitive. Quest based learning is different. It offers multiple branching uh, opportunities for you to explore sections of that curriculum at your choice, at your leisure. You can do that alone. You can do that with other members of the classroom. Your head may be spinning a little bit thinking, how in the world, what does this look like? What does class look like where, where, where this student or table over here is doing something completely different than this table over here? And I'll describe that here in a little bit. But it's this idea of a branching uh, story where you actually receive um, badges and rewards, not for the purpose of motivation, although it does motivate a small uh, percentage of the students, about 20%, but to mark the competencies and, uh, and achievements that they've, they've reached. So just think about that. So we'll, we'll dig into this. And I, I want to I show you what this actually looks like. We, we tried to completely gut, modify, patch uh, Blackboard and Moodle and Angel in the very beginning to be able to give students a flexible path. All of those systems will allow for adaptive release. You complete these things, then this is available but none of them allow for branching. So we, my uh, colleague Dr. Lisa Dolly and I at Boise State um, looked around and said, well, could we build a simple, simple version? Could we just have someone script it in Java? We knew what we wanted it to look like. And so we, we raised a little bit of department money and we built an alpha version. Then about a year later, uh, we got a little bit more money from the university and built a beta version. And here's basically what it looks like. What does class look like in quest-based learning? It looks like a game. In a typical class, everyone does the same thing. There's no way for me to pursue my interests, choose activities to support the way I learn best, or customize the experience. But in a game, there are lots of choices. I can choose from many different activities that all lead to the same winning condition. In quest-based learning, it's the same. Class becomes a game where I can work towards winning and getting an A in class too. And I can do it my way. Let me show you. Quests are individual lessons that add up to a class, but in a quest-based class, there are many more activities to choose from. In my quest-based biology class, I can choose activities that interest me right now. I can choose by category, experience points, keywords and tags, user ratings, and even how long it took other students. I can find out more about a quest before choosing it, including what other students have said about it. This can help me choose activities that work best with the way I learn. The quest itself can include all the video, text, and media I need to learn. Quests can be solo, cooperative, or even competitive with other players. Quests can be 100% web-based or give directions for something to do in the classroom. It's great. When I finish it, I turn it in right there. I can give notes to my teacher about the activity, upload a file, or link to a website that has my finished work. It's so much fun. Then I get to add my feedback. How long did it take me? What do I rate this activity? What comments do I have for other students who might want to complete it? I get to actually influence what happens in my education. Because it's like a game, I earn experience points for completed quests rather than letter grades. If my activity is not right, my teacher sends it back with changes so I can learn from my mistakes instead of getting penalized with a C. I can keep doing activities and leveling up until I get the grade that I want and win the class. It's amazing. Like a game, I can also earn awards, badges, and achievements for doing stuff in the game. I can get rewards for doing all sorts of things like finishing five quests in five days, great grammar or spelling, finishing groups of quests, just about anything you can imagine. Instead of a grade book, 
I can see progress bars showing how far I have to go to the next level and the end of class. Unlike a gradebook class, I always have the opportunity to learn from my mistakes and move forward at my pace. Because I'm choosing my path, I can finish the quest as fast or as slow as I need to go to get it right. I never feel behind and always know where I need to go. Sweet! I leveled up! Now I have tons of new quests available. This type of learning suits me better than a traditional graded class because I have a say in how I learn and get to make choices. I can always see where I stand and what I have to do to get to the next level, literally. This is what learning looks like in the future and I love it. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to the game. I mean, biology. So my poor son uh, had to read that script. He got to the end and he was like, Dad, I can't say this. I have to get back to the game. Er, yeah. So I, I apologize for him um, because he asked me to say that every time. Um, but as, as you look at it real quick, I'll just recap a couple of the, the differences in the approach. Using social networking tools and YouTube and things like that that we know have, uh, where it's, work is being done that quantifies the, uh, I guess, the attractiveness of certain tools, uh, star ratings and average time tend to be two of the, the biggest elements of, of that decision event uh, that helps students choose things. If a student has 30 minutes and they can complete something in 19, um, they will. They'll, they'll uh, select an activity like that. Let me, let me show you just a little bit uh, more about this. I'll actually we'll dive into this system here in just a second. I want to make sure that we have plenty of time that's okay. That that will be our. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the research, but let me let me show you the active tool. I'm going to sit for a sec. I hope you won't think me rude. And then we'll uh, we'll pop back in there. So currently, um, we have about 7,500 users in the system worldwide. We built it at Boise State. We tested it for about a year and a half by ourselves, and we started bringing in beta teachers. So there are roughly um, 600, 650 now beta teachers. We're about to bring in a, a big group uh, through NOAA, um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, there's, we've built some curriculum for them as part of a grant. Let me see if I can shrink this down. This is the actual interface. This is my, my teacher interface. This is a class that I'm teaching this summer. Um, and you see all the quests that are available as a teacher. I can take a look at them. Um, approving student work is a relatively simple process. And this was the, maybe one of the hardest things to convince people of in the beginning. Well, how do I give them 80 points instead of 100? You don't. Well, what about all the mistakes that they make? You address them. And so this poor student, oh, she's nice. She won't mind. I'm going to send one back to her right now. I don't know if there's any spelling or grammar mistakes on this. We're, we'll find out. But say, but say she did it right. Say that it's perfect. Say I click on this link, which is the, the artifact that she submitted. Because um, of FERP, I really can't show you her student work. But you understand. Um, I, would, I would approve it and then add an award to it. Maybe I'll give her a kitten or a mushroom. Um, whatever, whatever silly awards we make up for ourselves. Um, and I'll, I'll simply return this and send it back to her. It goes back to her active or actually in progress quest list. You can see any of the, uh, the pieces. We can continue to hand something back and forth until a schema is developed that allows them to attend to the next thing better. Often, and this has been our experience asking our students, why did you turn it in like this? Why did you, you know, complete a blog post with all lowercase i's? Are you dealing with this, by the way, lowercase i's? Is it a virus? Is it like like the precursor to the zombie apocalypse. It starts, yeah, and they start in the lowercase i's. Uh, I don't understand it. It's making me crazy, college students with lowercase i's. But, um, and, and seriously, a comma? Would it kill them to put a comma in a sentence? All right, sorry, <laughs> enough of that. We can build that schema. I can, I've got a little uh, tool right here that uh, is just part of a, the Firefox browser where I can, you know, it's a common problem that I have to address a lot. Um, I can uh, copy that and, 
I don't have to spend a lot of time doing it. I've got some spelling videos and grammar videos, punctuation videos ready to go that I can just say, hey, this show, shows you how to use a, a passive causative. Let's try that. Um, and I can send them and, and continue to teach without penalizing through grades. Um, often we find that this schema that is lacking in students develops over the course of the semester. So that's, in essence, what it looks like. Um, as a teacher, on the teacher side, I can, uh, I can look at any student in, uh, in my class. All of their names here are, are veiled. Um, I can see what this student has been working on. This is their player card. This is also the same thing that they can see. Let me just do a quick. Um, we'll grab this student who's really trying to progress through this class quickly. She doesn't have any badges currently. Um, the, this class requires them to earn three badges of their choice. There are ten available. Ten available. I think there are ten total available, so they can specialize in different areas uh, of this class. This is a class for pre-service teachers, by the way. Shows you the achievements that she's earned. You can always click on those and find out what in the world they mean. Um, the students can can do that also. And uh, and also, I can look at when their quests were completed. She doesn't have any in progress right now, or he. I can't. I don't want to say um, and uh, and I can look at their activity, what they, what comments they gave on different things, when they completed things, different things they interacted with. Um, it's a it's a very valuable way of doing it. Um, in in short, we decided we would test this approach by breaking a curriculum which had been traditionally module based into selectable modules. They could just start this module and it would branch. Until they, uh, until they completed it, and then new things would become available. Let me jump back in here. Hopefully it doesn't take us to the beginning. Um, and uh, about a year, year and a half ago, we, uh, we tested on, on a four classes, a cohort of uh, 97 students, to see um, what types of decisions they would make. The nice thing about this, the tool we built is that it's web-based, and so we can capture all click data, and we can find out some interesting things about them. Also, up here, I have a short white paper I wrote about that. Also, there was another study I did about what makes different types of learning activities attractive in a game-based, quest-based system. Um, but the, in short, they did a lot of work. They didn't do everything, which was really interesting. You'll notice that um, out of se uh, the bottom one, 73, that was the number of quests that were available in a group. The average number was 37 that they had to complete. Again, the A option, the B option, both showed the same thing. Um, 210 were left unfinished. They started them and then didn't have the interest uh, to finish them. We actually went back and looked at those activities to find out why. Did they just occur so late in the cycle they weren't necessary for the winning condition? Or was there something just funky about this activity? Um, second chances, that, that was the number of quests that were submitted but weren't quite right. We sent back, they sent back in again. So um, we issued a lot of awards, badges, and achievements. And that is the, the quantifiable number. Uh, up at the top there of the 97 students, uh, 30, you know, 37 was the average number of quests completed to win the class. And, uh, and their average user rating of five stars was, was just under four and a half, which is really instructive. Because if you have a, a, an activity that's trending at two stars and getting lots of negative comments, you can redesign that in the middle of the class before the next student even touches it. You can even pull in those students to say, Okay, this one was a stinker. Why? How do we fix it? Oh, we'll do this, this, and this. And you get students actually creating and writing curriculum. This, I think, is the most telling thing. These are the, these are the, uh, each of these bars represents, in experience points, the, uh, the path of each student. Of, of, let, me, let me say that in a better way. Each of these bars is one student's progress through the course. Now, typically, we, we average at, at kind of a B bell curve in this class, historically, in a module base. There are a handful of A's, there are a handful of B's, there are a couple of C's, fewer D's, and then a chunk of F's, typical to university, either abandonment rate, which at our university is about 9%. I guess nationwide it's like 11. People who sign up for a class and then stop coming after week three. You all were with that person in the dorm. You know who we're talking about. You like to see them on Wednesday afternoon. They're just sitting in the room. Do you go to class ever? Um, Covers by the dorm flu also. But that white line right there uh, is, was the winning condition. 2,000 experience points, and you won the class. You could collect it wherever you wanted. 
not only did the vast majority, 93%, actually achieve that winning condition uh, of an A, comparable, by the way, to, uh, to the module-based A, when you compare their portfolios. People were here for the Google uh, Sites thing before. Um, we, we use Google Sites as our portfolio. We compared those portfolios side to side, and they scored the same. We have a really interesting phenomenon here, don't we? If the white line right there is the winning condition, and by the way, the rule in the class was you are done. You don't have to come back again. You, you don't have to stop by. You don't have to be nice. It doesn't matter when during the course you achieve this, you're done. Why do we have all those red lines continuing to go up? Riddle me that. Thoughts? Fun? What? The, the achievements to unlock. Yeah. That, I wonder what happens if I get to 2,200 points. A couple, yeah, that very top group, competition. Um, I have another handout up here which talks specifically about uh, Chris Bateman's work. If you don't know Chris Bateman, Chris Bateman is now pretty much uh, owned, I think he's a, a servant of the video game industry, but he started out as an academic looking at different player styles. He developed a tool called the DGD1 model and later a tool called BrainHex, which you can go and take a look at now allows you to take a short survey, and it tells you, in essence, what type of games you like and why. What he finds out, uh, with I think now over 100,000 completions of this survey, is that there are different pockets of interest. If I ever ha have a journal of my own someday um, where we publish just results from obvious you know, studies, we're going to call it the Journal of Duh, right? Because, well, yeah, people like different things. He showed that there's a competitive element, right? And that competitive element is between 5 and 15% of a population, the ones that want to beat each other. There are a couple others who may be a little competitive, but in the end, they don't care, right? So yes, the top 5 to 10% in this group fall into that category. Some of them continued because it was fun. Any other thoughts as to why people continued to play through a curriculum they're done with? Often, and to go back to our, uh, our diving platform versus swim uh, comparison, often folks who would have chosen the swim early on because they didn't feel like they had the skills, the bravery, or otherwise to attempt the other, would eventually circle back and complete the thing that they chose not to do in the beginning, which we found really interesting, that their schema had broadened and developed. Uh, yes? Yes. No. Not completely. Okay. Absolutely. So the grand question is, what is what does class really look like when students are given choice? Okay. So the the class that this was tested in, and by the way, of of the you know 600 teachers that are doing it, everybody's doing it a little bit differently. Some people do it like I do. Others, uh, others do it more um, didactically through, here are the three quests available this week. Choose which one you're going to do today, but you'll do all three, right? Less choice. I mean, there are, there are levels of, of, you know, of autonomy. Um, the class that I'm teaching right now during the summer is, is completely autonomous. There are no meeting sessions. They just start, and when they finish, they finish. But this class that we did this uh, testing in, and where the largest amount of our data is, because it's at the university where we can actually go in and see these students, is a 16-week class that meets twice a week for an hour and 20 minutes. So it's a, like a Monday, Wednesday class. It's a traditional classroom. It's got desk or tables, no desks, and it's uh, it's like a mobile computer lab. There's a laptop cart, and students pull out one of ours or or their computer, and they just start working on stuff. Um, about 55 percent of the time would be considered open lab. You know, we're going to have music going in the background, and I, as a teacher, am going to be circulating and kind of working on things uh, with people. Um, uh, about 20 percent of it is didactic. Didactic may not be the right word, but uh, organized, guided activity. All right, everybody, we're doing this quest today. Roll the dice and figure out which group you're in, and here's the quest we're all going to do. And, uh, and, and the remainder is often small groups mixed with this autonomous work on what you want to time. Um, the primary principle being, if I can get you to get excited about working on anything today, if you're motivated, 
I want you to have that motivation. There are still some things as a teacher in the performance art of teaching that I can't let go of. There's some activities I want these guys to do with me because they're crazy fun. You know, they're, they'd be very difficult to do independently, but as a big group, we can, we can build spreadsheets using M&Ms, you know, and have all the, you know, crazy conversations about green M&Ms and do you know what they're really for, you know, those kind of things. Those are fun. Those types of group activities, um, outside activities, field trip kind of things, are quests that everybody does on, and they're available that day and we all do them together, we all submit them together. Um, the rest of it is this mixture of small group activity. Hey, I noticed you guys are all working on this and so are you, so why don't you come over to this table and you guys can cheat together. I mean, collaborate, right? And we put people together in small activities or pair people or I'll take somebody who finished an activity and pair them uh, as a mentor with somebody who's really struggling with an activity and give that the person who's the mentor a badge, an award, or some some other, you know, bonus for them to reteach. And in the end, they're you know, we're reteaching. So the classroom itself um, is still a required meeting. Um, they have they have pockets of choice within an ever, I guess, unfolding curriculum. Um, they don't come in and see all 110 quests in the system. They enter and they see four. You know, and they choose which one. And as they complete different things, more things unlock and branch, similar to that tree. Do I have an image for that? I may not. Um, maybe I can zoom out and kind of find that again as, a, as an example. Oh, yeah, it's right up here. There we go. Does that answer your question? So it's a traditional class with a lot more kind of open uh, environment, time to work on what you want to work on. Part of that is a, a really exciting process where we work with students to develop more curriculum. So a, a student will say, yeah, this is cool. Um, and I sit down and, and talk to them, so what are you interested in? What are you working on? Um, you know, what do you do? Oh, you're a tennis player. That's really interesting. And, and we look for different ways where we can take an activity that was created, for, you know, interacting with one thing and maybe create an alternate version of that that interacts with something that they're really excited about. Back to that, taking what they're interested in and helping develop a curriculum. Because we've removed this idea of, of a gradebook approach where everybody has to complete the, uh, different things, you can complete something completely different but meeting the same standards, tagged to the same standards as somebody else. Uh, it's, it's been an incredibly successful uh, approach for us. We're still hovering about 93%. Um, students who don't finish the class within the 16 weeks, by the way, the average completion time is 12 and a half weeks now, uh, as opposed to 16, which has been an interesting um, discussion with my colleagues at the university who believe that um, the pain must last as long as it is required to last, and also that we're not failing enough students, that we should be failing more, you know, that the students who stop coming are the only ones who fail, we should find a way to fail those that come the whole time. Okay, so the the curve the curve is not uh, dangerous enough. Questions, thoughts. Sort of. Yes, there is there is a uh, there's no due date assigned to any of the pieces, and I should mention that each of these quests. Uh, we try to build so that they're completable in 45 minutes or less. The magic number actually in our research is 39. Quests that have a uh, 39, that's where the decision tree analysis, I don't know if you know much about data mining, but all the click data and all the experience data allowed us to build these decision trees. Um, not a person's decision, but actually um, the, the uh, I can't think of the word, it'll come to me in a second, um, but, but the way that uh, the decision basically went. So if it was 39 minutes or less, it had a much higher level of completion than if it was 39 minutes or more, right? Um, and so, so we try to build them so that they're short, more granular. If we have this big activity, we break it into pieces and we stack those so that the second part of that activity is not available until the first one's done and completed. So students can do something today of meaning. And that may be as simple as, you're gonna write a five-page paper. Uh, I don't have any five-page papers in my class, but, um, and so this, 18 minute assignment is write a thesis sentence and three lead uh, paragraph sentences, right? Here's my thesis and here's the introduction to the three paragraphs that, uh, that are gonna support that page, you know, that idea. 
Um, that might be quest number one. The second one is to outline. The third one is to brainstorm. And, you know, those kind of types of things. You break it into those, uh, those pieces, and when they, when they complete it, they have a culminating activity where they submit that final piece. So the due date at the end of the semester is an interesting one because typically, unless a student has just you know, not come, if they're not at that point where they finish the class, which is about 3% of, of students, um, we, I, I at least, myself and a couple other teachers who teach at the university are doing the same thing, issue them an incomplete. The class is not done. They don't get a grade. They can continue working. Now, if they don't within, I think it's a year, uh, complete those pieces, um, then they receive the F. But if they do, whenever it is, they receive the grade that they earned without penalty. So that, that process for us allows us to really be flexible at the end of, at the, end of the semester. Now, that won't work in every K-12 environment. It simply doesn't. Um, there have to be other benchmarks. Um, the, and, and a lot of our teachers who are teaching um, usually 612 um, will create um, non-punitive goals. Like, you know, if you're, if you're to leader five level, you know, because you, um, you can create ranks in the system. Um, I'll click on that and you can see what the ranks are for this class. Um, uh, associated with different experience point values. If you're at learner one, by you know this break, then you get this award. But if not, then you know you'll be at at the blue table with me. Where you know where a teacher can actually you know help pair them with and try to figure out some of those those issues. That's what's being done a lot to kind of eliminate that that pain of due date because the the problem with due dates is if we don't have something that needs to be done or can be done today, we'll put it off and put things in its place that are at least to us, more important. Does, does that answer your question, or did I dodge it like a seasoned professional? Yeah. And, and it, 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 it tends to, we've, we've had to get real creative around systems um, like PowerSchool and you know, all of those, not just content management, but, uh, but grade management systems that push progress reports based on due dates, you know, things like that. So. Uh, which, is, which has been really interesting. In the very back. If someone may need to pass your question forward. I, I heard you, you exercise your calves a lot more. I do. Um, yeah, yes. Um, so we, our earliest teacher currently is second grade. Our current, uh, earliest beta teacher is second grade um, all the way through uh, doctoral programs. Schools can what? Yes. Yeah, so, so what you choose as an artifact is entirely driven by what you do, right? So uh, we have a teacher who teaches a chemistry class, and it's quest-based, and they have one computer in the classroom. And you walk over, you select a thing, and the quest will say, grab worksheet number five. <laughs> grab it as a piece of paper. So, and and the, you know, when you've submitted it, you go back and you're right, I put it in your box. I mean, it's simple as that. But it really does a nice job of leveraging digital artifacts. So um, great example. Yeah, I mean, as, as you talk about a music student, okay, we're working in this you know, book or this primer play at number 39 you know, at this tempo um, with a high degree of accuracy. Or coupling it with other tools. We're using smart music. And so you know, complete that. Take a screenshot of, your, of that completion page and submit it with this quest. Those types of things. We're also working on the data adapters or APIs, as some people still call them, um, that allow the tool to communicate with other tools so that you can accept a quest and it makes that connection that when you complete this activity over in this place, it'll send its little electronic signature back to the system and automatically approve that. Quests can either be um, auto approved. Say, for example, I've got a short minute introduction, a three minute introduction video that I want them to watch before they enter into this project, I can make that a quest and, and tell the system I don't need to see it. I don't need to look at that quest. You can just auto-approve that 15-point quest. But, um, but something else, uh, I'll just show you what the quest builder looks like. You as a teacher create all your own quests. All the quests in the system, too, are automatically assigned to Creative Commons licensing. So if I want to um, tap any of the other 600 teachers and see if anybody's got some quests using Minecraft, which is a tool I love to use in the, in the classroom, 
I can search the Quest Armory. Minecraft is school. No, I want Minecraft in school. Here are all these quests created by other folks. I can, uh, I can clone that quest into my curriculum and then make any changes to it so that it fits my, my exit standard. Yeah, we built it. Well, there are, there are two ways to access. One is through the university where we're accepting beta teachers. Um, there are some places that, because of the grants we're in, we can't uh, work. And there are some teachers who don't want to be connected to the research that we're doing at all. And they can just buy access to those. Um, currently, the, the university stopped directly funding it about a year ago. So we supported it with grants for an, another year. And now we, we have a small contingent of folks who are participating in. We, we found a creative way to fund it um, by doing teacher camps, you know, where we could give people access but really provide them uh, you know, continuing education units um, and, and those types of things. Brings in just enough money to keep, uh, keep the programmers fixing bugs, adding new features, and, uh, and really paying for hosting. Which is, which is what we do. So, uh, GoGo Labs is the is the technology spin out that worked from from the university to make that happen. I, if if you guys know much about the way, you know, ideas that are born inside of a university um, get outside the university. Um, imagine a mouse giving birth to a baby elephant. It's about that easy. Actually, that would be easier. Um, but at the university, you can't buy Tic Tacs without like three signatures and a meeting with the dean. So, uh, so getting, getting simple things like, hey, we just want to hire a graphics designer. Um, oh, great, let's list that. And uh, we'll have a meeting about that in six weeks. And then uh, we'll open that up. And after a month, we'll close that. I mean, it's, it just is impossible to get things done quickly. So, um, so we moved it outside the university with a process called tech transfer so that we could allow more people in. So any other questions? I'll say this, that, um, that there are lots of tools that you can do this with now, not the least of which is a tool called Badge Stack. If you're familiar with Badge Stack, um, that's another one that can be used this way. Typically, badges are one-to-one, -one, complete this activity, get this badge. Um, they don't have quests or challenges kind of built in. Um, but there are other tools. If you're interested in, in connecting and maybe being one of the beta teachers when we open the door next, um, let me know. Um, they're, the research up here, I unfortunately, I failed to staple them. So you'll notice they're kind of um, flipped perpendicular. You can grab a little stack of three or four papers, whatever it is. So, And uh, I, I've got a few of them up here if you want one. If you are a gamer teacher, um, we've got a badge you can add to your badge here. It's totally against the rules, so don't tell anybody. Um, but uh, you can, you've got a couple of these. You can get them here. Uh, or, or our Boise State booth. So thank you very much. I will say this. Um, it has completely changed the way that we have been able to reach our students. And the, uh, the experience for them has just been mind-blowing, especially for these teachers who are about to be teachers. They want to find ways to be able to offer choice to their students in the same way it's been offered to them. Um, it hasn't been without problems. Our biggest problems have been students go through curriculum too fast. Um, and unless you have a, a, an option for them, um, they tend to finish curriculum much, much faster and then want to build their own curriculum, which is a great problem to have. And, and the, the other problem uh, has typically been in many uh, educational institutions, it, the, the removal of the punishment piece tends to fly at odds with the conventional wisdom of those schools. It's been really strange. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun teaching in a game-based environment. And we do use video games also as some of the quests, um, but it's the video game overlay that we talk about as games and games. So thank you. If you want to come up here and chat, great. Otherwise, go get something nice to eat, and I'll see you tonight, I'm sure, sometime. <laughs>